Femininity by Susan Brown Miller. Chapter 4. Voice. A boy's voice breaks in puberty. This celebrated milestone in the pathway toward manhood is reached after a surge of testosterone has induced a stepped-up division of cells in the thyroid gland and in the cartilage of the larynx. After the boy's box enlarges, the vocal folds vibrate more slowly. They resonate through the nasal and oral cavities, also larger in the male, to produce a sound that is deeper and stronger than in the woman and children. A girl's voice also lowers in puberty, but the mild transition may go unnoticed. Only men have Adam's apples, those knobby protrusions of cartilage at the front of the neck. Their absence in women has been celebrated in art, poem, and metaphor. A white swan's neck with a delicate arch. A smooth expanse of vulnerability. One could argue that an Adam's apple looks vulnerable too. Once the larynx is enlarged, the effects are irreversible, unalterable by physical castration or large amounts of estrogen. Castration jokes about a suddenly high-pitched male are unscientific and silly, reflective though they are of masculine fear. Castration before puberty is another matter, ritualizing, sorry, ritualized in music as late as the 18th century by the sweetly singing Italian castrati. An Adam's apple can be a dead giveaway in a male-to-female transsexual, for removal of the throat bulge by surgery is a difficult operation that is usually avoided. A man who wishes to approximate a woman is stuck with his larger vocal chamber and deeper voice. He must practice like an actor to pitch his tone high. But since an enlarged voice box is induced in puberty by androgen, a woman who wishes to approximate a man can develop an Adam's apple and a deeper voice through testosterone treatment, just as she may grow a beard. On the average, the difference in pitch between men's and women's voices is almost a full octave, a true example of sexual dimorphism that is about as consistent as size. A typical female sound in conversational speech corresponds to three half tones below middle C on the piano. A standard male sound registers one octave and a half tone below middle C. Trained singers can stretch the normal range into upper and lower reaches from col coloraturo sopranos to basso profundo, but most people have a speaking range that rarely exceeds one octave. There is a fractional overlap between the usual male and female tones. Child, grown-up men, women. Biology gives us fairly reliable auditory clues and our ears are attuned to the signals. We expect to hear certain sounds from certain bodies. We are perplexed when they do not meet our expectations. Failure to identify the sex of a telephone caller is oddly disturbing, for the information is the first stage in a subconscious process of naming and placing. Sexual dimorphism in voice is an important guideline, a reassuring indicator of the natural order. Those whose voices fall mainly within the overlap are mistaken, for the other sex too frequently to, for comfort. When audio cues fail, the burden of proving gender lies more heavily on the male, for the low-voiced female is allowed a trick. She can soften the edges of her tones with breathiness to make her speech sound sultry. A high-voiced male is given no relief. He cannot make sexual capital of his vocal situation. Falsetto mimicry is a slander at manhood, a slur on the testicles, not on the larynx. Most animals produce sound and communicate in a rudimentary way among themselves, but interests in signing chimps and chatty dolphins aside, only humans are capable of true speech. Speech is the distinguishing feature of civilization. Language is the crucial achievement of the homo sapien brain. By studying brain-injured people, neurologists discovered that speech capability, including reading, writing, and analytic functions, are located in the brain's left hemisphere, while the right sphere holds the capacity for visual orientation and spatial concepts, which extends to artistic and musical skills. But there, perhaps, the matter does not rest. Recently, a theory has been put forward claiming that the human brain itself also may also be sexually dimorphic. 
Clinical tests show that from infancy onward, little girls excel in verbal skills while boys move ahead in spatial skills during adolescence. Girls begin to talk earlier, are quicker to speak in fluent sentences. They learn to read sooner, have a larger preschool vocabulary, and perhaps a better memory than boys. When they reach adolescence, the boys become more adept at solving geometry problems and three-dimensional puzzles. At every age level, more males than females stammer and stutter. The ratio is four to one. What does all of this mean? Are the test score patterns merely reflective of societal expectations and pressure, of parental reward and practice, or are they reflective, as those who hold to the theory of the male-female brain believe, of basic neurological differences that are genetically programmed and hormonally shaped? And which alternative explains the stuttering males? Science, as yet, can make no determination. In the next 50 years, it may well be proven that the left half of the brain is innately more responsive in females, and the right half is ordained to be developed more fully in males. But hardly enough evidence is in today for me or anyone else to cast a wise ballot for or against a sexually dimorphic brain. For the time being, it is enough to say that woman, the communicator, has had her capacity to speak acquired and transmit knowledge, squelched, hindered, restricted, and scoffed at in every age in the name of the feminine ideal. The sad history of prohibitions on women's learning is too well known to be recorded here. Without access to knowledge, half of the world's population could instantly be eliminated from competitive lists. One need look no further than the underlying for the underlying reason. In much of the world, women still are barred from advanced knowledge and technical training. Germane to this book are the theories offered as an excuse to keep women dumb, for they bear on a cluster of feminine qualities as men have defined them, and that women seek to fulfill. Shakespeare wrote, Shakespeare wrote that a voice soft, gentle, and low was, quote-unquote, an excellent thing in a woman. Yet the public voices of women in his day, except for the queen, were non-existent. Females were barred from the stage in Elizabethan England. Lower-class dialects were merely amusing, sorry, yeah, were merely amusing to the British elite. But when the harsh, untutored accents were spoken by women, they grated on the upper-class ears as particularly strident and shrill. The fishwife, hawking her wares in the market, went into the dictionary as a coarse, vulgar-tongued woman. Her husband, the fishmonger, remained a mere seller of fish. If Eskimos have several words for snow because snow looms so large in their daily lives, what may we conclude about the English, who devised so many words to define a woman with a loud, unpleasant voice, a short temper, and impertinent speech. The fishwife is joined by the shrew, the harridan, the magpie, the virago, the termagant, termagant, and the scold. Dickens has a teacher of manners instruct Little Dorrit to mouth the words, quote unquote, prunes and prism, when entering a room because the effect on the lips is so pleasing. In Shaw's Pygmalion, Henry Higgins transforms the street vendor, Eliza Doolittle, into a fair lady by modulating her cockney tones. Fifty years ago, elocution lessons were all the rage in Brooklyn for immigrant Jewish families who wished to give their daughters the right advantage. Sons were prepared to study medicine and law. The great French and German philosophers of the 18th century addressed themselves with vigor to the questions the questions of female education and feminine deportment. Rousseau theorized in M.E. that the purpose in educating a girl was to render her quote-unquote agreeable to men because women by nature were quote-unquote framed to please to live in subjugation. Rousseau's educational theories were designed to perfect a winsome creature who was spotlessly clean, inherently modest, naturally polite, and a bit of a coquette. 
Her feet were quite small, and in matters of food, she preferred tiny sweet cakes to meat. To gild this delightful lily, Rousseau instructed that she should be given lessons in singing, but not in the reading of music. She should be allowed, quote-unquote, no books of genius that would tax and upset her mind. There was no point in teaching her abstract mathematics, nor in taking her to Paris, for she would find the loud noise of the city distressing and would want to go home. Attention, he instructed, should be paid to her elocution to encourage her, quote, pretty manner of prattling, end quote, an animated face. There should be practice in the pleasing art of the curtsy and perhaps in the harpsichord to best display her pretty hand. Proper training should be given in quote-unquote cooking and the buttery, in needlework and lace making, especially in lace, quote, because there is none that gives a more agreeable attitude to her person or in which her fingers are employed with more dexterity and grace, end quote. A girl so educated would have, quote, taste without study, abilities without art, judgment without learning, end quote. She could then be called by Rousseau's highest accolade, quote unquote, oh lovely, ignorant, fair, and be a fit wife. Quote, she will not be her husband's tutor for his discipline. Instead of desiring to subject him to her taste and, in and inclination, she will enter into his. Such a wife will be better and more suitable by far to him, then if her head was filled with learned lumber, end quote. Ah, Rousseau, he struggled to fill his own head with learned lumber. He taught himself music and developed an original system of notation. He studied mathematics. He traveled to Paris many times. Quote, unquote, reader, he asked, quote, which would you prefer, a woman with a needle in her hand or a female genius scribbling verses surrounded by pamphlets of all sorts, end quote. Rousseau was true to his ideals. No pamphleteer for him. He hooked up with an illiterate servant girl who bore him five children that he put in a foundling home. <sighs> quote, unquote, oh, lovely, ignorant, fair. In A Vindication of the Rights of Women, Mary Wollstonecraft hurled herself against Rousseau, she could not contain her rage. From a more secure position in the 20th century, we may now explore the, with dispassionate neutrality the thinking of Immanuel Kant, who also read Amy and who never had an intimate relationship with any woman. Within the stiff sentences of this German philosopher of the beautiful and the sublime lies, a technique of pure femininity that education would damage. In Kantian logic, charm in a beautiful nature form a feminine essence that is inborn, but rather easily bruised. Women have, quote, very delicate feelings in regard to the least offense, end quote. They, quote, love pleasantry and can be entertained by trivialities if only these are merry and laughing, end quote. Good-hearted, sympathetic, compassionate, and friendly women at all times, quote, prefer the beautiful to the useless, end quote, and are, quote, unquote, intolerant of commands, and do things, quote-unquote, only because it pleases them. What pleases them most is, quote-unquote, adornment and glitter. The feminine characteristics that Kant describes are not very different from the set of virtues that American plantation owners, in sentimental moments, ascribe to their slaves, who were also denied education, but the, the reasoning behind the denial of knowledge to women is somewhat different. In Kantian logic, a woman's gentle, sensitive nature must not be marred by, quote-unquote, painful toil. Overcome with great difficulty in the drive for success is noble and sublimely masculine, according to Kant. Quote, Deep meditation and long-sustained reflection do not well befit a person in whom Unconstrained charms should be shown nothing else than a beautiful nature. Laborious learning or painful pondering, even if a woman should greatly succeed at it, destroys the merits that are proper to her sex. A woman who has a head full of Greek or carries a fundamental on fundamental controversies about mechanics might as well have a beard, end quote. Abstract speculation and use 
useful but dry knowledge upset her, quote-unquote, finer feelings. Quote, a woman, therefore, will learn no geometry. In history, they will not fill their heads with battles, nor in geography with fortresses, for it becomes them just as little to reek of gunpowder as it does the male to reek of musk, end quote. Kant and Rousseau have a point. If one accepts the idea of inborn feminine qualities and believes they are placed in the quote-unquote fair sex to render them pleasing to the quote-unquote noble, then one shouldn't tamper with human nature. One should stay far away from geometry, mechanics, and the history of battles, as most women have. Deep meditation will earn us frown lines above our fair brow. Laborious learning will get us squint lines around the eyes and a pair of glasses, and we know that Dorothy Parker said about girls who wear glasses. To sustain membership in the fair sex, one should never carry a fundamental controversy over anything. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is power, and the lack of it is charmingly feminine. Between the blue stocking and the dumb broad, there is no doubt who lies closer to a natural feminine state as men have defined it. A variety of curious theories were floated in the campaign to keep women from knowledge. In the Victorian era, it was not woman's charm but her uterus that was in mortal danger from geometry and Greek, as doctors sought to convince their patients that a woman's reproductive system could be upset by intellectual stimulation. But the femininity argument, the danger to the traits that men find pleasing, has been women's own compelling fear. Belief that the feminine nature could be coarsened by learning has been coupled in history with the idea that it is in women's nature to talk too much. Loquaciousness in the female sex has been remarked upon, not surprisingly, by the most Voluble of men. Women's wagging tongues was discussed by Aristotle, Aristophanes, Juvenal, the Babylonian Talmud, Swift, Ben Franklin, Shakespeare, and Milton. Her silence was counted as, as a virtue by Sophocles, Plutarch, St. Paul, and Samuel Johnson. Babblers, tattlers, gossips, chatterboxes, nags, and scolds. The descriptions apply to one sex only and suggest a severe defect of character. It is said that women gush. We run on about insignificant matters, and when entrusted with something important, we can't keep a secret. The din is infernal. What's a man to do? A popular pub in London, The Silent Woman, named for Ben Jonson's farce, has as its tavern sign a headless female torso, the final resort. Quote, one tongue is enough for a woman, end quote, was the excuse of the blind poet Mil excuse the blind poet Milton offered his friends for why he would not teach his resentful daughters Latin and Greek, although he had them read out loud to him from the classics without understanding. A biographer rallied to Milton's defense with the explanation, quote, it was a masculine jest with centuries of sat satirical laughter behind it, but later ages, more conscious of women's emancipation than of her traditional 
Gorality, have sometimes heard it with a literal mind, end quote. Centuries of satirical laughter have not been an aid to women's confidence in speaking, but the attempts to silence the woman's voice have gone further than satire. In Orthodox Judaism, a woman is exempt from synagogue prayer because of her motherhood duties. If she chooses to go to a house of worship, she is required to hide behind a curtain or screen. Although women are active as prophets and preachers during the early years of Christianity, St. Paul put an end to their work when he told the Corinthians, quote, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, end quote. During the Protestant Reformation, William Tyndale, the Bible translator, took on St. Thomas More to argue that women should be allowed to preach, baptize, and administer the sacrament. Tyndale did not prevail. During the Middle Ages, Christian theology, as well as chivalric custom and secular law, condoned wife-beating for such offenses as lying to a husband or scolding him before others. The Book of the Night of La Tour Landry, which set forward the duties and customs of upper-class society, was the most popular manual of its kind in medieval Europe, favorably mentions a husband who broke his wife's nose for scolding him in front of others, quote-unquote, with evil and great language. Writing on indictable offenses against the, uh, the public order in 18th century England, Sir William Blackstone makes reference to the common scold, provides her with a Latin name, communis, Rixatrix, and adds the witty aside, quote, for our law, Latin confines itself to the feminine gender, end quote. A common scold was a woman who disrupted the peace of the neighborhood with her ribald speech or abusive tongue. She was punished by confinement in a ducking, in a ducking stool and plunged into a river, lake, or pond. The scold did not have a male counterpart, and although the ducking stool was utilized for other offenses, the igno ignominious punishment was identified in the public mind with noisy females. Ducking stools, quote, for the correction of unquiet women, end quote, were celebrated hilariously in popular English ditties. One poetic example, quote, there stands my friend in yonder pool, an engine called the ducking stool, by legal power commanded down the joy and terror of the town. If noisy dames should once begin to drive the house with horrid din, away you cry, you'll grace the stool, we'll teach you how your tongue do to rule. No broading wives, no furious wenches, no fire so hot but water quenches, end quote. An iron muzzle with a triangular bit that fitted the mouth known in Scotland as quote-unquote the Branks, was another device to silence an idle tongue during the Middle Ages. Locked into the Branks, an offender was chained to a post or led through the town for all to witness her shame. Male blasphemers and some paupers also were sentenced to wear the Branks, but like the ducking school, stool, the scolds or the gossip's bridle, its other familiar names, went down in history as a punishment reserved for raucous, troublesome women. English colonists brought the definition of a scold to America, where, according to historian Alice Morse Earle, the ducking stool was in great favor in the cavalry colonies of the South and in Quaker Pennsylvania, set up near the local courthouse along with the pillory, the stocks, and the whipping post. She quotes a Virginia statute, quote, Whereas oftentimes many brabbling women often slander and scandalize their neighbors, for which their poor husbands are often brought into chargeable and vexatious suits and cast in great damages, be it enacted that all women found guilty be sentenced to ducking, end quote. Eyewitnesses reported many duckings in Virginia. A letter written in 1634 describes the ducking of, quote, one Betsy wife of John Tucker, who by ye violence of her tongue, has made his house and ye neighborhood uncomfortable, end quote. Betsy Tucker was ducked five times before she was penitent, and she was the third such case that summer. 
In colonial Philadelphia, the ducking stool was considered a quote-unquote just punishment, but a, but a visitor from Boston in, eight, in 1686 found that, quote, scolds they gag and set them on their own doors for certain hours together for all comers and goers to gaze at. Were this the law in England and well executed, it would in a little time prove an effectual remedy to cure the noise that is in many women's heads, end quote. It is worth noting that a woman with a gag in her mouth is a staple of present-day hardcore pornography. Quote, Meekness is ye choicest ornament in a woman, end quote, was a popular saying in colonial times. Women were not permitted to speak or hold office in the church, and there was even some question as to whether they should be allowed to sing the psalms under a literal reading of St. Paul. Yet, as the country grew, organized religion was unable to silence a number of impudent females who found their own sects or who preach who founded their own sex or preached their own brand of evangel evangelis evangelistic worship. The list includes Anne Hutchinson, who wished to remove the stigma of original sin from Eve and was banished from Massachusetts, Sojourner Truth, 40 years a slave and 40 years free, who earned her living as an itinerant preacher and raised her voice for women's rights, Mother Anne Lee, who founded the Shakers, Ellen G. White, who formulated Seventh-day Adventist doctrine through her revelations, Amy Semple McPherson, and a continuing procession of charismatics, faith healers, and visionaries, and Mary Baker Eddy, who founded Christian Science. More typically, devout women were content to be moved by the spirit within the church choir, yet even there, Mahalia Jackson and others won international recognition as gospel singers. The verbal capabilities of women have been hindered in every age by legal restrictions on higher learning, which go back as far as ancient Greece, by prohibitions on devotional public speech in church, which effectively banned female contributions to thought and doctrine in the world's major religions, by use, sorry, by the infliction of humiliating physical punishments for the use of strong rebellious language, by wicked ridicule in poems and plays for alleged verbosity, and by imp imposing in the name of femininity a self-conscious emphasis not on content, but on modulation, elocution, and pleasing facial expression. Further, the historic division of work into male and female roles has had its own effect on choice of words and imagery. Add to these realities the continuing imbalance in the power relationship between men and women, and the fear of women that their femininity may be found wanting, and it is no wonder that men and women may speak the same language, but speak it with a difference. Note. Many languages of the world use masculine, feminine, and neutral genders in their grammar. In the dim origins of speech, when few words and sentence constructions were in circulation, it is possible that grammatical gender had an actual basis in perceptions of sexual difference. This tantalizing thought has occupied the reveries of language historians. But a principle that explains to one linguist's satisfaction why the Spanish words for city and mountain are feminine, they are round and large, fails miserably when applied to German or Hebrew. Otto Jesperson, a renowned philosopher of language, was forced to conclude that no single principle governs the chaos of grammatical gender. End note. In The Woman Warrior, Maxine Hong Kingston wrote of her childhood struggle to sound like an American girl. Quote, Normal Chinese women's voices are strong and bo bossy. 
We American Chinese girls had to whisper to make ourselves American feminine. Apparently, we whispered even more softly than the Americans. Once a year, the teachers referred to my sister and me to speech therapy, but our voices would straighten out unpredictably normal for therapists. Some of us gave up, shook our heads, and said nothing, not a word. Some of us could not even shake our heads. At times, shaking my head no is more self-assertion than I could manage. Most of us eventually found some voice, however faltering. We invented a, an American feminine speaking personality, end quote. For Kingston, an American feminine speaking personality has its own coordinates. These coordinates are now the subject of intense research by a handful of feminist linguists, psychologists, and sociologists. Barry Thorne, Nancy Henry, Chris Kramer, Robin Lakoff, Mary Ritchie Kelly, sorry, Mary Ritchie Key, and Sally McConnell Ginnett, among others. In the next several pages, I have drawn on their research and combined it with my own observations. Speaking quote-unquote in feminine, or speaking quote-unquote in masculine, for that matter, is an imperative process that begins early in life. Like the clothes we put on each morning, the rhythms of our speech, in a sense, have been chosen for us. Some, style, some styles seem appropriate, and some do not. Speech is an assertive, an assertive act, sometimes an aggressive one, and male and female are schooled in different ways. Right from the cradle, girls and boys are spoken to somewhat differently, as they are handled differently by their gender-conscious parents. Mothers and fathers tend to use a higher sing-song register with baby girls, a sweet coo of isn't she pretty, as opposed to a brisk jovial hey, how's the little fella, and look at the little guy. Christians are great imitators, sorry, children are great imitators. How else are they going to learn? and the process of mimicry in the child helps to set the speech pattern for the adult. When men's and women's voices, sorry, when men's and women's voice tones are compared with the respective size of the vocal tract, the tonal differences are greater than the physical differences warrant. In feminine speech, the voice is pitched toward the upper end of the natural range. The decibel level is reduced and the vowel resonances are thinned. Writes Jacqueline Sachs, who is pursuing this line of research, quote, Men may try to talk as if they are bigger than they actually are, and women may try to talk as if they are smaller, end quote. The boring school voice of the debutante, a breathy vocalization of poor little rich girl helplessness, in a case in point, is a case in point. Sometimes a minor impediment, sibilance, a mild lisp, a gentle stammer, conveys an impression of feminine charm, much as the hesitation, sorry, much as the hesitant speech of a child is heard by grown-ups as cute. Far from working against their success, the controlled impediments of two top female broadcasters, Barbara Walters and Jessica Savage, actually may have given their delivery a softened feminine edge that men unconsciously find appealing. Not necessarily in contradiction, precise articulation of word endings, loving, not lovin', is also a feminine mode, cultivated, cultivating the impression that a woman is more refined than a man of her class, ladylike, or as some might say, affected. Speaking in feminine also produces wavering tones within a syllable and a careening range of pitch within a sentence to dramatize shades of meaning. Heard critically, the speaker sounds overly, overly emotional and insecure. Exaggerated to the stereotype, this is the quote-unquote speaking in italics familiar to readers of Cosmopolitan. Quote, I have this wonderful boyfriend and my favorite magazine said it's perfectly okay that he's married. End quote. The masculine stereotype is a cool, terse monotone, the yup and nope of Gary Cooper. 
Ruth Brend, who diagrammed feminine intonation patterns, reports that they often end on the upswing. Swoops and glissandos, she believes, build into a sentence structure elements of politeness, surprise, hesitation, and good cheer, and seem to beg for outside confirmation. Brend finds most men avoid speech patterns that do not terminate at the lowest pitch, at the lowest level of a pitch. Some men do incorporate musical swoops and rising inflection. Indulgence in campy speech by portions of the gay male community is a puzzle to straights who think they are imitating women. Those who speak camp might disagree. Whatever the underlying reasons, campy speech allows a male to be extravagantly emotional and sensuous about everyday things in a manner that is normally permitted only to women. It is to die, I heard a young gay man say in my neighborhood, in front of a pastry shop window. An emotional response to a piece of pastry is out of keeping with heterosexual manhood. But when the dessert cart rolls around in a restaurant, the ladies are expected to ooh and ah, and they usually comply. It is not that the speech of men must be flatly without emotion. Skilled orators like Winston Churchill, Billy Graham, Martin Luther King, Fidel Castro, and Hitler learned how to wring emotion from their audience by embodying passion in their own extravagant inflections. But politics and religion are certifiably masculine themes. The feminine and gay masculine infusion of passion into the stuff of everyday life is considered trivial, weak, and sometimes unstable by heterosexual men. On occasion, they have a good point. Vocal expressions of passionate interest in clothes and uh, are objectively no less significant or understandable than emotional outcries over a football game. But how can a man relate to the woe, the utter tragedy of quote unquote, I just ruined a nail? A less in person has invested daily time, patience, and work toward the creation of a perfect set. A broken nail is a peculiar cause for wailing. Feminine speech is charged with sudden upsets and cries. I've got a run in my stockings. I'm getting a pimple. I gained two pounds. These are inexplicable to those not engaged in the struggle for feminine perfection. Fashion and shopping add fanciful touches to feminine speech. Subtle gradations in color bear succulent romantic names. A woman speaks in familiar terms of taupe and oat, of plum, aubergine, mauve, and mulberry, of tangerine, sa salmon, cerise, coral, and peach, while a man may take inverse masculine pride in the broad generalities of light brown, purple, and orange. A feminine color vocabulary is filled with hues and shades that most men have little occasion to learn or would hesitate to say aloud for fear of being called effeminate or superficial. Significantly, more than 10 times as many men as women are colorblind to some degree. This is a sex-linked characteristic. Colorblindness is a sizable portion of the male population, particularly the white male population, where 6 to 10% see a limited spectrum, offers a possible explanation for professed masculine disinterest in the refinement of color. But if a man earns his living as an artist or in the fashion business, 
knowledge of color is not considered unmasculine at all. If one outstanding characteristic marks feminine speech, it is the reluctance to voice a, declar a declarative sentence, I say this, with certainty and strength. Robin Lakoff, a pioneering theorist of feminine inflections, devised a classic masculine-feminine exchange to demonstrate how women routinely turn a declarative into a faltering question. Man. When will dinner be ready? Woman. Oh, around six o'clock? Quote, it is as though the woman were saying six o'clock, if that's okay with you, if you agree, end quote, writes Lakoff, quote, here we find unwillingness to assert an opinion carried to an extreme, end quote. But of course, it is not feminine to express a strong opinion, even about something as uncon uncontroversial as when the roast might come out of the oven. Women are not supposed to be authoritative. By reputation, we are not even supposed to be able to present a set of facts in a rational, cogent manner. Analytic thinking, however, is believed to be a process of the left side of the brain. A female opinion strongly expressed is often considered emotional or bitchy. In the 50s, when a woman criticized another woman, easier in mixed company than criticizing a man, she might find herself greeted by a chorus of meows. Meow, meow, her observation was dismissed as catty. Even when a woman is forthright, assertive, highly competent, and successful performer on the stage of life, she may temper her speech patterns to fit a less challenging mode. Commands and directives that come from her lips will be modified with little grace notes, qualified with an extraneous phrase to take the edge off of the expression of power. Would you like to get that for me? Is a feminine turn of phrase. The underlying... The underling may have no choice. He will get that memo on her desk the first thing in the morning or be fired for incompetence. But the command has been softened, the power relationship disguised, the male ego left intact. Except when dealing with children, women are rarely comfortable issuing a command, not only because we have had fewer opportunities to be in a managerial role, but because commands and orders are blatantly unfeminine. A command uses a minimum amount of language. It need not be couched in terms of politeness. Politeness is required from underlings, but not from rulers. A command may be barked, but a woman must coo. Would you do me a favor and... It is not surprising that insincerity is a charge that is leveled at feminine speech. Few fault the Southern Belle for her insincerity, however. Insincerity is part of her flirtatious charm, as long it is direct as it is directed toward the gentleman in the form of compliments and feigned wide-eyed interest. Let's go over and fluff up Uncle Hubby, Lucy Baines Johnson, the eager student, told Barbara Hauer at the Washington party where Vice President Humphrey was holding forth. Fluffing up the Southern Bell strategy is a highly successful, vivaciously feminine conversational mode, redolent of magnolia blossoms, tinkling laughter and soft breezes on a summer night. 
the perfect style, short of silence, for women who are extraneous to male-oriented, power-driven society. Flirtation allows for some pert audacity, but it never goes for the jugular or engages in, can you top this? Self-centered interest in personal experience and feeling is another chain charge that is leveled at feminine speech. According to psychologist Nancy Healy, Hen Nancy Henley, a number of research studies find that women do disclose more personal information, quote, just as subordinates in general are more revealing, end quote. She continues, quote, self-disclosure, including emotional display, is not in itself a weakness or a negative behavior trait. Like other gestures of intimacy, it has positive aspects, such as sharing of oneself and allowing others to open up when the self-disclosure is voluntary and reciprocal, end quote. By contrast, a masculine verbal strategy avoids personal admissions, confessions of weakness and failure, and displays of emotion that reveal vulnerability and dependence. This is considered a wise, defensive maneuver in the competitive arena of business, arenas of business and warfare. Quote-unquote, loose lips sink ships was a popular motto during the world wars. A commercial advertisement in the 40s, quote, don't talk, chum, chew tops gum, end quote, had a patriotic slant that confused me when I was eight years old, because by that age, I knew that chewing gum was not a feminine habit. But the point is that trading baseball statistics, discussing the physical attributes of women, or negotiating deals is considered appropriate conversation among men, and being tight-mouthed about information that others can use to their advantage is considered a masculine virtue. Women devoted to the lifelong pursuit of romance and relationships cannot help but rely on their emotional feelings and the private lives of others as the backbone of their conversation. They accuse men, often unfairly, I think, of being uncommunicative and closed off. Men, for their part, are quick to assume that an intense conversation among members of their own sex is probably a theoretical discussion or a serious conference, while women engaged in earnest conversation most likely are exchanging love, love lives, recipes, or gossip. Is gossip trivial, reprehensible, and malicious by intent? Having worked in the news business for many years, I can say that reporters are enthusiastic gossips in private conversation, not only because they love a good story, but because their job is to make coherent sense out of the way the world functions by putting together odd, seemingly trivial pieces of fact. Trying to substantiate a rumor is a beginning step in investigative reporting. A sign of the changing times, what once had no place in honorable journalism among men, who sleeps with whom, for example, is now considered morally pertinent to biography and politics. Gossip is feared because it is disrespectful of the mighty when it exposes personal behavior at odds with public pretense. Women have a tough time getting listened to, except by other women. The Sphinx, who had the head and breasts of a woman, talked in unfathomable riddles. Cassandra was fated by the gods to see the truth and not be believed. Female prophets in the church were squelched as unseemly. And Sigmund Freud lifted up his head to inquire, Dear God, what do women want? End quote. A touch of madness or silence or coquettish uncertainty have been the feminine strategies when answering men. In mixed company, there's no question which sex has cornered the market on long-winded chatter. Men readily interrupt the speech of women, and women allow the interruption. In one systemic analysis of taped conversations between men and women, the men did 98% of the interrupting. Sociologist Pamela Fishman concluded that men are the talkers and women provide the support work that keeps the conversation going. In Fishman's study of male-female conversations, when women tried to initiate new topics, it was mostly without success. They generously followed the male suggested topics. They asked nearly three times as many questions as the men to draw them out. And they interject interjected frequently little boosts like, oh really, to keep things pe perking. 
Women also employ more body language than men to indicate conversational interest. Head bobbing, a flurry of little nods to show support and agreement, provides a visual accompaniment to the feminine task of animated, empathetic listening. There are many reasons why men interrupt the speech of women and get away with it. For one thing, more men have been trained to be verbally aggressive. In law school, an argumentative disputatious style is practiced in the classroom to sharpen combative skills. Courses for salesmen include training in how to make an effective stand-up presentation and how to be persuasive. But more to the point, boys, boys grow up assuming they have valuable information to impart. By tradition, girls were instructed by their mothers and advised by their teen magazines that the most appreciated quality in a young lady is her ability to listen, to play dumb on dates, and to act impressed in male company. In all female company, a church mouse can turn into a nightingale. I've seen it happen. Then, there is the very real question of how well female voices carry. A deeper male voice can drown out a lighter female one, and a woman has to work extra hard, truly assert herself, to override an interruption. Once again, a natural biological difference between males and females works to female disadvantage. A deeper voice seems more authoritative, like taller stature. On vice, advice on how to train a dog usually includes the suggestion to lower your voice register to impress your pet with the seriousness of the command. I always use this procedure on my sensitive collie and it worked. The dog hopped too. A deeper voice means business. But there is just so much lowering of the voice a woman can do. I never had trouble getting my devoted dog to sit or stay, but hailing a cab is another matter. When waving the arm fails, one must resort to, hey, taxi. A guttural shout, Dustin Hoffman's funniest moment in Tootsie. Ladies aren't supposed to shout. Neither are they supposed to whistle. Whistles and shouts are as unfeminine as belches, snores, and loud sneezes. Of course, no lady should ever be in the bereft situation of needing to hail her own cab, should she? Hey, taxi strikes momentary terror in my heart. As I hurl the ringing words aloft, I simultaneously worry that my voice won't carry and the cab will speed by and someone on the street will think that certainly is a loud woman. When hailing cabs, it might be inspirational to remember the great call of the gibbon, the monogamous primate who is our fourth closest relation, for vocal dimorphism in gibbons refreshingly gives female the center stage. The female's great call dominates their morning territorial display, and the pair of apes perform their gymnastic stunts during the great call's climax. A gibbon male has a short hoo-ha that he interjects between renditions of the female's aria, but her opening notes command this silence. Quote, the female gibbon can utter the short calls of the male, end quote, Joe and Elsie Marshall report in science. Quote, the male, however, never sings the great call, end quote. That's how gibbons do it. Actually, I'm good at hailing cabs, and I hold the floor when a male in a male-female conversation. I say this not to toot my own horn. Quote, a whistling woman and a crowing hen are fit for neither God nor men. End quote. But to make the point that when my reputation for authority does not precede me, my gibbon-esque arias get drowned out accordingly. Women know how to laugh appreciatively, indeed. Smiling and giggling are acknowledged feminine skills, but most of us are rotten at telling jokes. And many have learned to censor the belly laugh and the risable guffaws with a hand that daintily covers the open mouth. The aggression in humor is well known. A stand-up comedian takes conscious risks that are incompatible with feminine propriety. 
He holds center stage. He delivers a punchline. Get it? A punchline? He ridicules the manners and customs of others. Let me tell you about my mother-in-law. Would the reverse be funny? Irma Bombeck, a very funny woman, sits down to do her humorous riffs. And while she uses herself, the car, the washing machine, and the children as a subject matter, I have never heard any father-in-law jokes. Or many husband jokes, either. Comedic women are usually self-deprecating in the Phyllis Diller Joan Rivers tradition. With few exceptions, female guests on the Johnny Carson show present themselves as dizzy dames. Encouraged by Johnny, feminine dippiness became a talk show routine in the late night hours. Madcap femininity with a touch of in instability is a saleable female commodity, as Hollywood discovered. Bright comedians with the knack for playing dumb, vulnerable dips are quickly stereotyped, like Judy Holliday, Shelley Winters, Goldie Hawn. It helps to be blonde. Aware of the damage in this feminine stereotype, Jean Stapleton, who played slow, simple Edith Bunker on television for many years, stifle yourself, Edith, took pains to dissociate from the role when she campaigned for the Equal Rights Amendment. In a sense, men are right. The women's movement has no sense of humor. Using expletives is another mode of expression that runs counter to femininity and the power relationship in the most basic of ways. To no one's surprise, studies show that men use more four-letter words than women do, but younger women are narrowing the gap. I doubt whether liberation will bring us to parity in this regard. Something more than a disregard for politeness is involved in the classic obscenities of Anglo-Saxon origin. They are anti-female in intent and cannot be used by women with convincing authority. The shock value of the words may be an affront, but the, word, the power behind the basic image, the ability to follow through, is sorely absent when a woman says, quote-unquote, fuck, fuck you up your ass, buddy. Achieving parody in jokes and curse words is obviously not the cutting edge of the movement for equal rights, but being listened to is crucial. Sitting in a close circle and speaking in turn by, quote-unquote, going around the room became the first rule in feminist consciousness-raising sessions to make sure that every woman is reticent, sorry, that every woman, the reticent, the different, the reticent, the diffident, the shy, would be heard. The technique can work only in a small group, and there are some who claim that the leaderless small group best suits a woman's style of communication, rather than the hierarchical principle of an auditorium with a raised podium at one end. <clears throat> quote, give me a balcony in every town and I can take over a country, end quote. A Latin dictator once said, speaking to the multitudes from a certain removed height is a technique that few women have mastered or tried to master. Eva Peron, aside, demagogic manipulation of the masses has been a masculine province. A woman on a soapbox with a microphone in her hand, even if she is perfectly quaffed, will still be called strident, hectoring, or quote-unquote somewhat shrill, as the American press said of Margaret Thatcher the week she took office. Electronic amplification of a high voice annoys many listeners, and it doesn't help that audio equipment is set for lower tones, or that speakers' podiums are routinely built to the specifications of male height. 
For one brief shining moment in world literature, writing, quote-unquote, in feminine, gave women an edge in creative expression. Japanese nobility during the 10th century Heian period believed the Chinese language was superior to their own. They reserved Chinese for higher study barred to women, and they attempted to write their serious works in Chinese as well, in much the same manner that Western scholars use Latin and Greek. While they struggled to master the square formal characters of a foreign language, women of the court were free to use kana, a simplified phonetic script, to set down the language they actually spoke, permitted a fluidity and a naive idiom, sorry, a native idiom, that men denied themselves. Murasaki Shikibu, Lady Murasaki, author of The Tale of Genji, and Sai Shonagon, author of The Pillow Book, produced the lasting masterworks of their age. There is something very Japanese and very feminine in the story of Shanagon and Murasaki skipping past their fellow writers with a breaststroke light and true. Their experience was not, was not repeated elsewhere. In European ghetto culture, Jewish men of learning reserved Hebrew from themselves while others made do with Yiddish, but no Lady Murasaki emerged in Yiddish, or if she did, his name was Shalom Eilachem. No. But writing in feminine does not usually refer to the genius of Murasaki. It refers to the stereotype, to sentimental prose that is scented with lavender, that is vapid and suffocatingly enclosed. A feminine sentence is said to gush rather than roar. It lacks muscle and lean strength. It is precious and insubstantial. It limps along to inconclusion like an unstressed final syllable, inferior and weak. It suffers from italics and from excessive quotation marks when it tries to be slangy. When it seeks to break from its mold and be strongly declarative, it is said to raise its voice and become strident and shrill. Do women write in feminine style? If there is evidence that women speak in a feminine manner, how can this not carry over into writing since the rhythms of a written sentence reflect the cadence of oral speech? The feminine environment has been a world of closed interiors, imposed limitations, and cramped space. It would be strange in some instances if claustrophobia, desperation, and self-consciousness did not seep into the printed page. In A Room of One's Own, Virginia Woolf toyed with the notion that a distinctive feminine sentence, one that was not without positive virtue, but she did not define it, and her own style of writing, except in her diaries, was an extreme attempt to shake loose of gender. Toward the end of her life, she grew to detest her early essays and blamed the, their politeness and sidelong approach on, quote-unquote, sorry, unquote, my tea table training. I see myself handling plates of buns to shy young men and asking them not directly and simply about their poems and their novels, but whether they like cream as well as sugar, end quote. To be accused of a feminine style has haunted the psyches of women who write, for accusations mean, sorry, for accusation means critical dismissal, not chivalrous regard. George Eliot, the Bronte sisters, and George Sand did not care to reveal their sex on the title page, a masculine pseudonym gave protection, sorry, protective coloration to their words. And that was the only chivalry they required. Earlier in the 19th century, Jane Austen had coped with the identity problem by, publisher, by publishing her first novel as the work of, quote-unquote, a lady. Alerting the readers, suggests critic Rachel Brownstein, that there is, quote, distinctly feminine and well-bred voice, a voice, the voice of a genteel maiden, end quote, who desires to please. As recently as a decade ago, a university study attempted to gauge readers' response when the sex of an author was attached to a piece of writing. When the writing bore a woman's name, readers felt it was less competent, less, less significant work. A professor of English named Mary Hyatt put excerpts 
from the works of 100 contemporary authors into a computer to see if any general principles of feminine writing might emerge. The woman in her sample wrote shorter sentences than the men, had a tendency to overwork the word really in effort to be really convincing, thereby betraying the fear they would not be believed, and they displayed an overall tendency to play it safe with language. Caution is what marked the writing style of woman. I understand the tendency to play it safe when one feels grateful to be allowed to play it all. Quote, Literature cannot be the business of a woman's life, end quote. Robert Southey sternly repro reproved Charlotte Bronte, who had the courage to withstand his opinion. A more feminine woman, a less certain woman, one without egotistical belief in her own worth, would surely have acquiesced. She might have been imitative rather than original in the effort to prove that the business of literature could be hers. Or she might have chosen to scratch off a very small piece, a modest, negligible portion, to claim as her own. She would deal in the miniature, the cameo, the sketch. A more feminine woman might have given up thought of publication altogether to pour her passion into her diary, where she could express her emotions as freely as she wished and never face up to the unfeminine task of pounding her thoughts into a hard-edged shape. The hope, of course, would always remain that one day a reader would discover her soul.